I'm Ethan, I love muzzle loading. I was asked while on the 11 Bang Bang channel about some of the technicalities of rehardening a flintlock frizzen. And I got into a little bit of a conversation with Ethan at the 11 Bang Bang show there about lock geometry and how that can play into how effective and how efficient your lock is. I wanted to share that with you here today. So here's some of that conversation. You wanna answer that? Talking about, is it a hard task? I mean, I don't know I, if you can see it or not. Yeah, I can see it there, yeah. I, I think that's okay. a really great feature too. That's really su super cool. Uh, yeah. I think I, don't, I think with Petter Soli, I don't I don't think you'd have too much trouble. Um, yeah, yeah. I think you know I I look at things really simply, uh, and even when it comes to making things, um, you know, so kind of get a getting a simple understanding of of what hardening and tempering is. Um, you know, I think generally the the magnet test uh, works pretty well. You know, if if it's something that attracts a magnet, you heat it up until it drops the magnet, and then you're you're pretty well hardened. Is kind of the simple way to do it. You know, if you have a really limited shop, you know, you're just in your garage with, you know, a propane torch or something, that's a way to get it done uh, without any of the furnaces or temperature gauges or anything. Um, you know, that's how I would go about it if I, you know, needed to reharden a frizzen and it still had some life in it, or, or I thought I did. Um, I mean, you can always, uh, Petter Soli, there's enough of them out there that you should be able to find an aftermarket frizzen too that might just be a good thing to pick up uh, mm -hmm. so that you have a backup spare kind of thing but i think that's the kind of thing you can do uh, you know on a weekend or something in an afternoon and, and crack out and, and be back on the range what do you what do you think though i mean like i said i'm i'm really open to to learning more and, and eating my hat on something if i'm if i'm spouting the wrong thing <laughs> oh no you're you're good i'm i'm sitting here because the reason i say you're probably going to hear about that is because yeah. old char here i mentioned man i I've, I've worn through this thing shot it so much i think uh, too uh, to to jump back to your qu question here chris um you know the lock geometry at times on, on some of the the imported guns that might it might be a geometry issue over um, over the frizzen. So um, if you end up sharpening or, or not sharpening, sorry, hardening your frizzen and it's still not working, um, you might set up your phone or something and try to record your lock falling uh, and and see how it's hitting. Um, there's a bunch of, I mean, lock diagnosing is its whole, its own thing. I don't claim to know a whole lot about it, but there, there are various symptoms that can cause a lock, especially on, uh, you know, not to discredit them or, or, you know, speak ill of them at all, but on some of the, the cheaper locks that are out there, you can have issues with that geometry not lining up just because of variances in production. Um, so it might be the kind of thing that, uh, you know, you need to adjust your flint, you know, bevel up or bevel down is, is the first thing to do. Uh, make sure that your flint is really tight in those jaws, which you may have already done. I don't mean to, you know, repeat stuff that you might already know, but even down to heating up and adjusting, um, you know, the cock of your frizzen or the cock of your lock. Sorry, it's getting late for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> a, adjusting that a little bit up or down can help a lot on where that's hitting the frizzen and even down to like, your, your frizzen spring being too tough or too weak. Um, there, there are times where that flint falling and hitting that can, if, you're, if your spring is too strong, the, the fall can't push it back hard enough to get a spark going, or it can be too weak. And instead of you know really launching open like it should and letting that spark drop, those frizzens sometimes will come forward and then come back and your, your flint and your frizzen will strike multiple times on the way down, never getting a good hit. Um, you know, so if you have a modern smartphone, uh, you know, even a, even a 10 year old smartphone generally will have a slow motion video function on it and setting that up, you know, just even with the lock out of the gun and recording that in slow motion and really watching how that lock works, um, you know, you might get some more insight uh, of what's causing your issue if rehardening the frizzen doesn't get what you need yeah and you're talking about on the cheaper locks like this paget like i said i got a lot of work to do on this gun but i'm yeah. gonna make her work really good uh you can see right now that is the that is the cock being down you can see it's almost oh, straight really? up and down as it is right now yeah so and full cock is clear back there it's way back there wow <laughs> so I've got some work to do with yeah. this gun, but I'm, I'm going to make it work. There's um, a guy by the name of Larry Pletcher, and I think uh, Steve Chapman helped him out with it. There are a couple Indiana guys, um, but in the late 90s and the early 2000s, they got access to like a super high-speed camera. They produced a series of, 
super high speed film and I think you can find it online. I think blackpowdermag.com, Black Powder Magazine is what it was published under. They did a series of super, super high speed flintlock videos um, that show you how those locks function and how different powders function um, in the pans of your flintlocks and kind of debunked a lot of the theories about different granulations of powder in the pan. Um, they were really came out with a lot of evidence that said you don't necessarily need 4F powder, which many of us know. Mm -hmm. um, but really, they came out with some really v right in front of you, you know, hitting you over the head with a baseball bat that you the thicker or the, the larger granulations of powder in a pan can actually be better depending on the lock that you're using. Um, and those that was kind of one of the tests that those videos uh, put forth and, and studied. But the other thing was just how these locks function in like hundredths or thousandths of a second. It's yep. really fascinating because those locks, and they, they tested a variety of locks, uh, but a lot of times we think it's a really simple procedure, but it's oftentimes really complex. And it's really interesting to see how these locks perform with that super high speed. So I encourage anybody that's interested in that kind of thing to seek out some of that film. Like I said, um, Larry Pletcher, I think, was kind of the head of, of that project in, in Black Powder Mag, Black Powder Magazine, is where you should be able to find it. Really interesting stuff. Yeah, and that's another thing, you know, I've noticed that it really does help with the whole, uh, people talk about flint being pointed down towards the touch hole. Yeah, that and, geometry is I crucial. Think, and what's funny is, though, on this old 1728 St. Auntie lock, it doesn't quite do that. Right. But I've works. noticed that. I did the slow motion thing with my uh, phone. Good. And what I found with this gun is the sparks, whenever you're striking this, actually kind of come up into here, and they bounce off of the hammer up here and then into the pan. Yep. So it works really good. But, yeah, that's just kind of how this gun <laughs> rolls, I guess, is how they designed them back in the day. Yeah. That was a really good question, Chris, and I hope you can yeah. get it figured out. It's, it's, it can feel like a complex and intimidating process, but you'll have a – a greater understanding of, of your muzzleloader specifically when you kind of go through that a little bit. And I think it's it's good for everybody to go through that at least once to kind of get an understanding of it. This was really just a short segment of our entire like two and a half hour long conversation. So if it's the kind of thing that you enjoyed these selected clips from, I encourage you to check out the 11 Bang Bang channel. You can find the full conversation there. It was all done live, no preparation for it, which is a lot of fun, just to kind of jump right into it and, and have some muzzleloading fun.